Good evening and welcome to 8.30 with Mihlali right here on RUTV. I am Mihlali Ntsabo. Where we grow up, how we are raised, our morals and our values are some factors that play a crucial role in how we choose to define and identify ourselves. And tonight, we will be looking at what identity is in South Africa today. Before we start, I would like to stress that some of the following content may be explicit or triggering for some of our sensitive viewers, and viewer discretion is advised. So what does it mean to be African? Is it one factor or many put together? Take a look at this. What inspired our blog? Uh, I think it was just us trying to create a uh, space um, for Africans. And um, there's this amazing TED talk where someone talks about the dangers of a single African narrative. And we are six different Africans with six different ways of expressing our Africanness. So we thought we have a common interest in creating a space for Africans, a dynamic space for Africans. So we thought, why don't we get together and make this amazing blog where we express different, um, how different it is to be African. It's not a single um, way of defining it. So we thought, why don't we do that? part of my identity is being African and I feel like it's it's a huge part of my identity for several reasons. I mean first of all I'm living in the continent so that's gonna directly impact everything I do. Um, on a like a political historical level things like visas, how we relate to other people, um, the history of colonization and its remnants now I mean where we're in Grahamstown and I'm surrounded by a lot of era buildings. That's something that figures into my identity. Having grown up in a sort of Western Eurocentric environment, so I didn't get the opportunity to learn my mother tongue either from my mom or dad. I didn't get a chance to learn all my cultural customs and traditions, so I feel a little bit lost culturally, linguistically, and I'm like, I am African by the mere fact that I'm black. So in my personal narrative, I recited the, um, I don't know if it's a song from a Spike Lee film, but it goes, I'm black, y'all, I'm black, y'all, and I'm blackity black, and I'm black, y'all. So I'm going, yes, yes, yes. And I just, it resonated with me because I felt that my link, no matter what, you can't take it away from me, you can't judge it, you can't say, oh, she's this level of Africa. By the mere fact of me being black, I felt like Africa was something I could play. <laughs> We call her the spirit lady. She's <laughs> very within. I can start to feel that whatever I am is, 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 is so enough um, and, and so complete just the way that it is. It's a big part of transforming the black mind, the black psyche. Um, without going into conversations about black consciousness and trying to get deep, it's, it's just about the way we see ourselves and how we understand our role in existence, in the world. Africa itself is my, uh, multi-dimensional. Like, if you, people always like make these jokes. Like when my family comes from Congo, they're like, "Well, South Africa is not Africa, Africa, because it's so modern." They're like, when you go higher up, it's more Africa, because it's more rural, less developed infrastructure is not as here. So then, like, what is authentic? Authentic does authentic Africa mean rural Africa not developed? I beg to differ. So then you can't exactly come up with one authentic identity. Like I said, Africa has so many countries. Like, in which country embodies the true Africanness? Well, as you can see from that video, there is no single way to be African. It is, in fact, all up to you. Helping us to discuss the issue of identity in Africa today, I am joined by three studio guests. On my right, I have BSc student and gender activist, Zuko Tawe. Next to him, I have um, BSOC side student, also a gender activist, Sikona Nazo, and Dr. Linda Spencer, who, a, a women's fiction and African literary studies lecturer from the Rhodes University English Department. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Dr. Spencer, I'd like to start off with you. So when we talk about people in Africa or African people, who exactly are we talking about? <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge question. Mm -hmm. um, it's extreme. I mean, I think one thing that I say to my students is, yes, there's, we can talk about an African experience because if you start to talk about um, 
issues of colonialism we have we all have shared even Ethiopia which was not colonized in a way has also shared some form of um, colonial impact of the what we call the colonial encounter and so yes sometimes we use African in very broad s strokes to mean something um, but it is as heterogeneous as you can get. Yeah. If you look at countries as well, you can't say South Africa is a homogeneous country. If you look at ethnic groups themselves, ethnic groups are as, homo as heterogeneous. You go into ethnic groups, you look at the clan system, the different clans within, different, within each ethnic group. So it is as heterogeneous as it can be, like, you know, general. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very complex way. There are specificities, but there are complexities. And I think the thing that we need to constantly negotiate is how, how, what is it that connects us? What are the interconnectedness between us? But what is it that also makes us or makes different people particular to a different to individuals in, within a specific mm, space? Okay. So well, you seem to be nodding your head a lot. So are you agreeing with Dr. Spencer? Yeah, I do. Um, the problem with the discussion that's happening, especially now that you know, with the whole like the rise of woke politics, um, is that people tend to talk about the African identity as something which is not only presently homogenous, but like should be homogenous in the future. Mm. Um, and the problem with that is number one, it's exclusive to people who may be deviant to whatever definition it is of Africanness that you want to mm. base that homogeneity around. Um, and also it just detracts from some of the like the, the fundamental things that that personally I think Africanness is about right so like one of th one of the cornerstones of the African existence is uh, communitarianism right so the idea that um, you live not only for yourself and to and to your own benefit but to the benefit of your family your community you know everybody else around you kind of thing um, so yeah that's okay. basically In our male-dominated societies, it is often said that men are the head and women the neck. But is the idea of what a man is really that simple? The young men in the next clip refuse to conform to gender norms and give us their own definitions of what it means to be a man. We will also tackle the issues defin of defining what being a man is in society in our pseudo discussions. But first, let's watch this insert. No, boys don't cry. Not crying, boys don't cry. If it's crying, I mean, if I cry in front of other men, they look at me as weak. At this point in time, I'm not comfortable with calling myself a hyper-masculine man uh, because of the oppressive nature that, um, of being a man. And I'm not comfortable to be called someone who is responsible for the oppression of so many other people. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, my title of the book was um, on, on, on no, hashtag no homo. Bitch niggas, um, bitch niggas, man hugs, etc. Um, society has society has this weird view, in my opinion, of what masculinity and what being a man is. In in that, from what I've seen when I was growing up, men and males are supposed to be these rough individuals who are so aggressive, who don't show their emotions. The fact that men, men are portrayed in that way sort of has a stifling effect amongst ourselves. And I, I look at this in my friendships with other men. Um, you know, we, we all sort of hesitate to, to show each other affection without having to put that, you know, classic tag, no homo. You know, we, we, we feel the need to always defend our or protect our masculinity in a way. I think society does not allow us to decide that by yourself. Um, and should love us decide by yourself. I feel like we are shaped into how we should be perceived and how we should act, and I find it very problematic. I feel like, like I'm a free agent, and I, for myself, should define what a man is. Mm. I, I remember in high school, um, before warming up, we would used to play music, you know, and um, they'd play, our teammates would play, my teammates would play, Hip hop, they play kind of rap music, you know. And for me, as a person who stands for Beyonce, um, I would love to listen to Beyonce, suck myself up um, listening to her music. But because in that setting, um, it's a masculine, you're about to play a very masculine sport, um, 
you know, the whole camaraderie amongst men, you know, the very dominant kind of um, nature of those environment. I can't, I can't listen to Beyonce, I can't play Rihanna, you know. With masculinity and homophobia, it's basically when society says, or when certain individuals say, you don't fit my view of what a man should be. You should conform now. You shouldn't be like this. I really, really like collecting flowers. Like, I even took botany for some reason, because I really, like, I love the aesthetics of flowers and how pretty they are. And most guys don't get that, because I don't know why. <laughs> I think in an ideal world, being a man would be just being yourself, you know? Um, I think we can have masculinities, but I guess the difference is um, where they become very problematic and very violent is how we exercise really? them, you know? You're lying. Liar, liar, Did you just put... Throw... An item of clothing of mine which doesn't kind of live up to the gender norms would be my crop tops, because um, now I have two. Um, because men can't wear crop tops, right? Um, the crop tops are seen as um, clothing for women, only for women. I love this crop top, wow. Um, but I also think in an ideal society, even the, the, the term being a man, I think it kind of connotes something, you know, that someone has to be a certain way. We have to start moving away from categories which kind of impose um, a certain kind of identity, you know. So now moving to the last video we just watched um, about masculinity. So we saw the young men express how uncomfortable they feel about how society defines it, what as what a man should be. So what are your thoughts on that, Suku? Um, the video was quite interesting because it highlighted how masculinity as a construct, right, as a, we can talk about masculinity as a thing up there, um, how it is simultaneously um, repressive to, the, to, to, to men who subscribe to that kind of masculinity in the sense that like, it limits their ability to be deviant from the definition of what masculinity is. But it also, because of the fact that masculinity is a product of the patriarchy, and because of the fact that patriarchy benefits men, masculinity, this idea, is also beneficial to, to them because it puts them in the position of the aggressor in society. It puts them in the position of, of the one who controls, the one who is dominant, the one who is able to navigate certain spaces because of their subscription to this idea of masculinity, right? regardless of whether or not they want to. So the, the conversation about people wanting to subscribe to this, to this, um, to this definition of masculinity is one which I think that Utilani talks about quite nicely um, in the sense that like it is also a very homogeneous right mm -hmm. and um, we need to d deconstruct this idea that masculinity is an identity to which people should aspire so this is like so there are like definitions of what masculinity is and people should like try to become that thing as opposed to people just existing and living their truths and having that become masculinity or whatever you know what I mean Okay, you touched on a very interesting point there, but um, Sikon, I want to come to you quickly. So we also um, learned from the piece that how the men link how society defines as manhood to s many oppressions, um, such as women oppression. Could you please like, give us your thoughts on that? Um, okay, so I know, um, for example, um, in, 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 in maybe like the African context, um, how manhood is always seen as like, the man is the head of, of the household. Um, and that and that links to oppression in the sense that now women are always then seen as the sub, you know, mm. um, and, women, and then men are always superior and that feeds into patriarchy and how um, women are always like oppressed. Um, so I think that's how it links to how um, women are all, yeah. Okay, so taking into account what all three of you said, so like, do you think there's a way forward in terms of how we can portray like a different outlook on how to define what a man should be outside of you, Dr. Spencer? 
Yeah, I think, I, I mean, Zuko talks about deconstructing masculinities. And even, I think, it, it, and myself, and I find it problematic, the term masculinity and femininity. And I still use those yeah. terms. Yeah. Because, for example, if we want to, we talk about, and I think Pumla Tola talks about this in something, masculine femininities or feminine masculinities, yes. especially in terms of sexuality. <coughs> and like, what is it to, what does masculinity mean? So, I think what he said there towards the end is people just, we need to find, in fact, completely new terms and people should just live their truth, do whatever it is that they want. It shouldn't be seen as masculine. And if you're f female and you do, you're described as being masculine, feminine, feminine fem femininities or femininity, feminine masculinities. So I think the terminology in a way restricts us and we find ourselves caught up in that, in in trying to even trying to ex escape it, and and I don't know what terms one can use, but we need to be able to just let people because there's all constructions that you were, that you're talking about, all of them. I mean, those young men where they're talking in the video, it's just construction. And how do we then not use that terminology? How do we change that terminology? And so that, like Zuko says, people live their own truths. Well, and do whatever it is they want. Well, you're still tuned into 8.30 with me, Sally, and we're talking about African identity and the way it re which relates to masculinities and femininities. As always, you're welcome to share your thoughts with us on our social media accounts, like on Twitter, at MissLally830, using tonight's hashtag, Identity830. Before we continue with the discussion, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to watch the next piece. This piece is about celebrating the vagina. It's about taking back power. Dear Vagina, why is everyone so damn afraid of you? What did you do to the world? Everyone seems to think that you are a problem. Close your damn legs, grand shouts to six-year-old me. Close your damn legs before the boys can see, before the men can see, before your uncle or daddy come and find you on display. Vagina, can't you hear? All those around you speak of you in hushed tones. Their voices drop at the mention of your name. You must have really fucked up for them to speak of you in such a way with disgust and such disdain. Why wouldn't they anyway? After all, you shed tons of blood for a couple of days a month with no supposed reason. Like seriously, who hurt you that you must bleed in such an uncouth manner? Close your damn legs, they command. They command me to keep you in this thigh prison. My thighs, your prison guards, supposedly ready at any moment to protect you. I must warn you not to get too comfortable, dear vagina. Your thighs are not impenetrable. I wrote it um, when I was just also going through a very, a very intense phase of, of self-awareness and of finding myself where I am and who I am and just being woman and what does being woman mean. Then I thought about also sexuality and why as women we're not really allowed to proclaim our sexuality because then if you do, there's a problem with you. You're either a hoe or, you know, yeah, it's, it's very problematic. I like to talk boldly about things that people like to speak in hushed tones and then I thought okay every time someone says vagina people cringe even when I would say it at the time I would cringe myself and then I decided to think about vagina and you know what image comes to your mind when you think of vagina. When I wrote um, Close Your Damn Legs, I, especially at the end, you know, um, when I say that your thigh guards are not impenetrable, 
that's you know it's just also calling out patriarchy and saying you're constantly telling women and telling us girls to sit with our legs closed but then you're the same people who come and intrude who come and invade so what are you on about what's your agenda type thing so it's kind of calling like checking patriarchy check yourselves because it's very um contradictory Um, but then at the same time, it's highlighting rape culture that it happens to one in three, you know, one in three, one in three. And that figure should constantly be on your mind. I do not consider the vagina a curse or a burden, actually, because it's a part of me. It is biological and, damn, it's magical. <laughs> I think it's the bomb diggity. All right, let's get into it. I'm Dr. Spencer. So we know that the, vag the vagina and discourse surrounding it are often seen as a taboo. Right? Why is it so? Uh, I don't know. In your understanding? I'm not sure. I guess it goes back to what we all keep saying about patriarchy and trying to control and contain mm -hmm. women. And, um, and I don't know why it's, it's, it's threatening <laughs> at all. I mean, I, Sikona, do you, do, you I, have, do you find it? Yeah, I think it's, it's about... It, essentially, it's just about policing women's bodies. Mm. Um, that's what it boils down to because we, uh, as women, you don't have agency to your own body. So everything you do is controlled by everybody else and everybody else has an opinion about it. So um, you don't even have your control of your own sexual agency. So that's why vagina is um, um, a taboo. That's why you also can't talk about things like having a period. And it's like a biological thing that happens mm. to ev like okay not everyone because that's very sexist but mm. I mean it happens to a lot of cis women so um, yet it's still it's still seen as something that you have to hush you only talk to your mother about it do you talk to your sisters um, when men are around the room you can't so it's basically about policing um, what women should do with their bodies okay and so what do you think has caused African women and women in general um, to start reclaiming their bodies and live experiences? <sighs> That's such a good question. Yeah, it is a huge question. Um, but I think a lot is changing in society. And people, mm. and, I, and I don't like to, I, I mean, if you look at social media, people begin to see what other people are doing in other places and wondering, but why? I mean, you can talk about the vagina, you can talk about women's hair, black women's hair especially, and that's the topic that's going on around. Um, but people are becoming more aware, whether, in whatever way, whether it's the body, whether it's about face, people are becoming more aware and they're begin, beginning, beginning to question. They're beginning to question hegemonic discourses. Mm. Whatever dis hegemonic discourse you want to talk about, whether it's patriarchy, whether it's power structures, what, whether it's gender, relation, gender norms, mm. people are questioning things um, more vigorously. And I think women are beginning to say, take back ownership uh, of their, their bodies. And I think women have always, they always have agency. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just becoming more more vocal. And as Scott just talked about this idea of, like, for example, period pains, period women not even talking, even in women sometimes. Mm -hmm. When you're growing up, your mo some mothers don't talk to you. They, hope your cousins or your older sisters mm -hmm. are going to talk to you. This oh, in boarding well. school, mm -hmm. that's where you, you find these things and you get all sorts of warped information about what it is. And yet now, for example, Kopana Matwa's latest book is called Period Pain. Mm -hmm. And 
and I think that's that's a way of putting it out there and putting it there for everyone to know. You get the books, sit and read whatever. I don't know what the book's about, but it's one I'd read because now it's like no, we shouldn't be ashamed of these things because uh -huh. there's nothing wrong with whatever with period, like she says. It's biological. There's nothing mm. you can do. Mm. I, I mean, it's there. Yeah. Okay, so Sikona, please tell us, what does it mean being an African woman in contemporary society? Tense. Yeah. <laughs> Tense, okay. Huh. So, as it, like, I think as captured in the, in the um, first section where we, we, how diverse African is, mm. I don't think I can have, um, like, one monolithic explanation of, like, what it is to be an African woman. Can you define um, it in the South African context? Right? Um, that also because there's there's every South African every Black South African woman has different experiences of um, of being a Black South African woman. There's different mm -hmm. experiences of being Black. There's different experiences of being woman, and there's different experiences of being South African. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think there's obviously the shared um, the the shared um, oppression of being black of being woman um and um being african um so i think that 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 um is what can we can all say that like is one shared experience okay. um so yeah but i don't think i can speak <coughs> on behalf of like everyone of what it like what a black South African woman experience is. Okay, let's make it more personal. So what does it mean, mean to, to you? you? Okay. Mm. Hmm. I don't know, because I have very, I have issues with um, identifying in terms of like, I am South African, I, like um, I am, uh, and also like culturally, because not that I'm trying to deny my culture, but also because of what, um, we need to be careful of what, how we look at our culture, um, and how we practice it because, um, we need to question who told us of that culture, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so how how we experience this culture could be informed by maybe colonialism or um, people trying to gatekeep how like black men trying to gatekeep like what being African is. So I think for me, I don't know. I think it's just existing in the space as a black woman. So I don't know, I also don't have a particular defined um, explanation of what it means, really. Okay, Dr. Spencer, as a black woman, do yeah. you share the same sentiments? Look, I, it, I do agree with uh, Sigourney. You have to question because we also, all cultures are patriarchal, so you can't take it on wholeheartedly. And this is why you find we question the vagina. If you go back to, that's about, about questioning. But I think Zukoto talked about, he called it communal light, what commun communitarianism, which is mere Ubuntu. And in different African cultures, it means something else. And if you go to the essence of that, there's something that we can take away from it that you can see how do you relate to one another in different places, but how do you let other people also define you or talk to you, talk about you? So, for example, what do you wear? What do you wear that makes you feel good about yourself? Or going back to the idea of hair politics, because I, I, I say this because um, I think we're ninth, the ninth, today's not the ninth, but Angela Davis is in town. She's going to give the Steve Biko lecture. And for me, the, not in town, in oh. the country. <laughs> in the country. Um, and, it, and, and she represents for me this idea. And I think for her coming into this country at this time and having this debate on hair politics must be a shock because these are the things she fought for years ago. Um, but it's how do, you def how do you relate to yourself and how do you relate to other people? And the other thing is, yeah, we might say we might be a bit trying to problematize this idea of being African, but also the world sees us in certain ways. So, for example, if I and Zikuna were to go on a plane and go into Finland, that world will see us mm. as African women. Mm. They won't see her as a South African and me as a Uganda. Mm. We are African. So the world somehow defines us, but then it defines us, it sees us and marks us in particular ways. But 
not allowing that marking. I mean, and I really have no idea. I can be very nationalistic at some point, I, and it might be problematic, but I don't see, sometimes I embrace that idea of being called an African person because for a long time, We've been the bane of everyone's existence. Mm. So it's some. So when you say, if I go into, I own that Africanness. Is okay. It me or like I prefer uh, owning my Africanness rather than my southern. It's not that, like, but I mm. think. Yeah. Um. The the nationalism is. I, I don't identify with that, but like mm. I'd much rather. Um, because uh, because being African is part a large part of your identity and okay. how you experience everything, but like. Um, I don't yeah, know, I've, patriot, I've problems uh, with patriotism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So in closing, um, Suko, do you think that um, there's a space in society for the different understandings of what, of how you as a man could define yourself or how you as a woman could define yourself? Um, presently, there aren't any, but normatively, there should be. Do you get what I'm saying? No. Please explain. So, like, are, th are there spaces, as in do they exist at the moment? No, they don't, right? Because, um, like, there's, there's, like, society doesn't like deviants. Society doesn't like people who deviate from a def the definition of womanhood. People don't like the de like people deviating from the definition of manhood. People don't like uh, people deviating from the definition, like, from the confines of gender, kind of thing. So at the moment, it's 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 not particularly safe for you to deviate from those definitions, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that there should be, like, there ought to be, like. Um, spaces and environments and like you know sort of conglomerates where people are able to okay. not only discuss this kind of thing but also just so exist. Like, how, according to according this is according to you. So how do you think we could create such spaces? Yeah, um, that's quite hard, right? Because I I think the immediate response would be to say would would be to like to talk more about these things, right? But I mm -hmm. I don't think that's enough, right? Like I think. Because um, I mean, these conversations have been going on, but the problems that they o they always happen in like, like progressive bubbles, mm -hmm. and they never happen outside of those progressive bubbles. Um, so I think it's I think for those who are progressive to go out into society and like aggressively challenge, like norms and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's I, I, I don't know. Like yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, Final segment. So, um, Dr. Spencer, any close, brief statements you'd like to add? I tend to disagree with Zuko okay. about spaces. I think there's spaces. I think a lot of this happens on social media mm. or YouTube. And there's people or bloggers who just, maybe it's not as visible in society. as, But I think there are ways in which people can re imagine themselves mm. um, in these places. And I've, I've, I can't remember his name, um, but he has a YouTube channel. He writes for Move, as Move magazine as well, which is, he has segments where he got, just does, and he's very, he's very, he's not, I don't want to say deviant, but he goes against the norm in whatever it is that he wears. I think you can create, you can, in Zuko yourself, sitting here with Neva, you are going against, you what yeah. what against everything you said you to wear short shorts yeah so he wears short shorts that's what he wants I think yes there are spaces and people are doing this but mm -hmm. is it en masse no and I think it's but it's testing the bodies and borders and disrupting those kind of things and I think in future we'll find we'll see more of that. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up the discussion due to time constraints, but thank you, Zuko Sikon and Dr. Spencer, for joining us. Um, stick around for today's Healthy Lifestyle, where we're looking at the stigma behind mental illnesses right after the break. Welcome back. If you have just joined us, you're tuned into the last segment of 8.30 with Michali, and we're talking about af mental illnesses. It is said that between as many as one in six South Africans suffer from anxiety, depression, or substance abuse. We sat down with Rhodes University student Ntoko Zolamini, who shares his experience with psychosis with the stigma attached to it in his family, society, and culture. Let's take a look. I have um, images sometimes that come into my head of my suicide, of 
homicide or violent acts or of hurting other people as well. Um, and that's why you th and that's why they say you have suicidal ideation, right? Which is the idea of suicide, but not actually being suicidal, right? There's a distinction. And when I so when I think of things, I think of them in a dialogue. And I do think culturally there is an inaccessibility to depression, right? And when I say culturally, obviously I mean blackness, right? But when I say blackness, I don't mean a monolith like every single black person. Um, but I think especially because of the black condition, right, for the last 400 plus years, it's been one of tribulation, right, it's been one of struggle. So my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncle, my aunt, they've all had significantly harder existential experiences. So when you, when you, when you have an entire culture that is like, that has a narrative of pain, for you to be like, I'm depressed is not always going to be acknowledged as a real thing. It becomes difficult to tell that person that for no particular reason you can't get out of bed. I mean, I have no doubt that most black people, a lot of black people, a lot of black people in this country and a lot of countries suffer from like a constant state of depression, right? I have no doubt. But because it's become their condition, their like normalized experience, they have to get up in the morning. Also, the, 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 the religiosity of the black culture, which is intense, a lot of black people are super religious, makes it very difficult, right? Because then, I mean, my response, my family's response, not the whole family, but some of my family, when I was like, I've been diagnosed with bipolar, they were like, um, pray about it. That the, the remedy for black pain in a lot of spaces has been religion. There's also this, perception in some black community that mental illness is um, a white experience. Also because in the black community you already have a very strong ukloya, which is essentially to be witch, right, in a badly translated way. Masculinity says to me, man up, right, don't be a pussy, right, don't be a bitch. So I had to like just shed off any sort of patriarchal and masculine, hyper-masculine narratives around pain and around the male self. I had to prioritize being alive. And so I've had to focus more on the fact that I made it, right? I've had to focus more on the fact that I stayed alive. And to also not accept the stigma of mental illness, to not hide the fact that you were depressed and you were suicidal and you almost died, to not feel bad for having had experienced that, then that's a victory, right? Your sadness is important, has been vital in me, just navigating, staying alive with mental illness. According to the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, between 16 and 23% of South Africans suffer from panic attacks or an anxiety disorder. If you feel that you or someone that you know is suffering from depression, you can call the Depression Hotline on 073-300-7865. That's 073-300-7865. Well, that's where we end of our show for today. But if you'd like to keep the discussion going, you can find us on our social media accounts, like on Twitter, at Michali830, using tonight's hashtag Identity830. Or you can find us on Facebook, at the Tooth Michali, and drop us your comments there. Or if you'd like to suggest a topic for discussion, you can email us at atmishlali at 830.com. From myself, Michlali Ntsabo, and the rest of the crew, that's goodbye for now. <laughs>